Welcome back to the book club. I'm Michael Knowles. And this month, we are going to be talking about how man rose up above the condition of, of a life that is poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. And the way we will do that is by reading Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. And we will be doing that with John Yu. John Yu, a very well-known legal scholar, professor of law at UC Berkeley, and interpreter of Thomas Hobbes for me, who had actually never read this book before this episode. John, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. I'm embarrassed to hear that about your <laughs> lack of knowledge know. of the philosophy grace, but you went to Yale. Mm -hmm. that, you know, the thing about <laughs> Yale, though, actually, is p people misunderstand this. The undergraduate at Yale is, is fine. It's the law school, actually, doesn't uh, oh, I, doesn't churn out the best. I agree. Well, the Yale Law School should be closed for the good of the country. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I sometimes think whenever people make jokes about mm. alma maters and things, I say, I don't. I don't think I can defend Yale really anymore. And really what we need is just a massive central power to come up and wipe all of these crazy woke <laughs> people away. So I guess we could turn our attention to exactly. Mr. Hobbes to help us do that. Exactly. So, John, everybody hates Thomas Hobbes, as far as I can tell. As far as I can tell, the libs hate Thomas Hobbes mm. and the conservatives hate Thomas Hobbes. And yet when I finally read the book, mm. we're all kind of Hobbesians, aren't mm -hmm. we? Mm -hmm. There would be no liberals or conservatives around if it weren't for Thomas Hobbes, because Hobbes and the Leviathan really creates modern political philosophy. Uh, for example, he's the one who comes up with the idea of the state of nature, yep. right? The period before we form society. Uh, the quote you just gave about life being nasty, poor, brutish, and short is his description of what life is like for all humankind without society, without government. And then he's the one who came up with the idea of the social contract, the idea that you're in a state of nature, we all make a contract and we form a government. This, these were unknown concepts hmm. before Hobbes. Hobbes also in this book comes up with the idea of the sovereign, the idea that there is a government, the sovereign, that's a separate artificial body than the people, hmm. which is, you know, this is a fundamental to our understanding of the American constitution. And then I think he gets a bad rap because people think, oh, he's a monarchist. But actually in his book, you'll notice he doesn't say it has to be a king or an aristocracy or a democracy. He just says there's a sovereign and it could be one, it could be many, or it could be a few who are actually the government. And then the last thing I think that he gets a bad rap for is uh, once you have the government, what's the point of it? And he says the basic point of government is to maintain peace and order. That's the purpose of society. He doesn't have a lot of strong views about what government should do other than that. He, and in a lot of passages, several passages of the Leviathan, and in this sense, I think he's the first great liberal. Ah, he's a liberal in the old fashioned sense of the term, which is that he would let people and groups basically run their own lives free of government. And there's a difference between public life and the government, which is about maintaining what we would call today law and order, and then letting individuals basically decide for themselves how they want to spend their time and lead their lives. So Hobbes is the first modern political philosopher. Maybe Machiavelli gets to claim that crown, but mm -hmm. Hobbes is certainly has a shot mm -hmm. at the title. So then the question is, what is Hobbes rejecting? Because mm -hmm. Hobbes has very strong words in Leviathan for some of the philosophers who came mm -hmm. before him in the Middle Ages and antiquity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this is why I think he's the first modern uh, philosopher and why, in a way, when you read it, you're like, oh, yeah, I knew that. I knew that because he, the, mod, the world he created, the principles he set out are now so familiar to all of us that today's philosophers are just like little footnotes to mm -hmm. these ideas, right? Like John Rawls, the great right. liberal philosopher whose I think ideas today are still the dominant ones taught in our universities. He's just talking about, well, when you're in that state of nature and you're making that contract, here are a few more things you should agree on. <laughs> right. Right? That's basically, this is just like a footnote to Hobbes. The reason why Hobbes is such an important break from, you point out, the scholastics of the Middle Ages or even the ancients. Mm -hmm. He, for example, rejects pretty strongly the idea of the Middle Ages that the king or the sovereign is appointed by God, yeah. right? And that's one reason he's modern, is that he his whole theory of why we have society, how we form a government, you notice doesn't mention really God at all. 
And as you said, you mentioned Machiavelli. So I think there, you know, uh, Harvey Mansfield, who is my philosophy teacher at, at the Better College, mm, yeah, uh, where we actually read this book. Disreputable <laughs> school up in Cambridge. Yeah. Actually, I have to say, I brought my own copy, <laughs> uh, which I am embarrassed to say is 35 years old. <laughs> the reason Machiavelli might be said to be the real founder was he's really the one who said, oh, uh, leaders, society, they act out of their self-interest. Right. Forget They're about not. these ideas of the good and yes. we're putting that aside for all that all that uh, mamby-pamby stuff. Mm. What do you want? What are yeah, you- and, and maybe what you could say uh, what Thomas Aquinas and others were trying to do was uh, there's God and God's law and then trying to make human law reflect yep. the rationality and maybe perfection of God's law. That's not what Hobbes is about. Hobbes is about when you're in the state of nature, which is not a concept that even exists under medieval theory. We all have a certain equality. And that's another reason he's a liberal. He he actually starts out with the idea of man is equal. But in that equality, we can do terrible things to each other. We can engage in great violence. Whereas maybe the medieval scholastics would have said, oh, if there were such a thing as state of nature, you would live according to God's law. You would be primarily peaceful. Hobbes thinks, and this is because he was writing at the time of the English civil wars, Hobbes thinks the natural state of man is violent and that we form society by making a contract with with each other. It's not because in the medieval times we're seeking revelation Hmm. from God, perhaps, about how we should live and order our lives. Hobbes says we're all pursuing our own self-interest, and because of that, we form a society basic to prevent us from killing each other in a state of nature. This is familiar territory to people who have yeah. read philosophy, uh, political philosophy today, probably because it, it starts with Hobbes. And, and so rather than seeking the highest good, the sumum bonum, mm. Hobbes is regrounding political philosophy on a, on a much lower plane, which is, okay, I don't know about the greatest good, but I do know what the greatest evil is. That's violence and death. And so what the, what the sovereign has to do is keep us all from maiming and killing each other. Is that a, do you think that's a fair treatment? Oh, no, exactly right, Michael. In fact, he says one of the most important principles is what he thinks of as the golden rule. He says in the Bible, the golden rule is, right, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. He restates it. He says, don't do unto others what you don't want them to do to you. <laughs> so for him, the guiding principle is the reverse of the golden rule. I'm not a philosopher. I'm a lawyer. To I, your great credit. Yeah, I, I enjoy <laughs> yeah. listening to my philosophy friends debate these, these very tiny things, uh, like the purpose of life. <laughs> but uh, to them, I think, to the ancients, perhaps, they didn't see this distinction yeah. between a government and then and, and achieving the good life. They thought the whole point of government maybe was to produce this highest good. That's why right, Aristotle famously says, man is a political animal yep. the, 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 by definition. Um, that's not Hobbes's goal. As you said, Hobbes is almost defining the minimal state of government necessary to have human society. And then he says things like, funny, he says like, things like lifestyle, diet, what you wanna do, what you wanna read, how you wanna spend your time. That's not the sovereign's job, mm. as long as it doesn't have to do with maintaining right, law and order. So he just sounds like a campus libertarian. You know, listen, man, you do you. Maybe not quite. Maybe there's, but this is what's so confounding about Hobbes. Yeah. I read certain passages in Hobbes and I think this guy's the biggest lib ever. And then I read other passages in Hobbes and I say, the guy sounds like a fascist mm-hmm. or, or a Stalinist or something like that. And maybe there's some kind of connection there as well. It's not just that he's rejecting the scholastics and the ancients in a sort of nice way. He mocks them. He says that the scholastics are just talking nonsense. The Mm. the jargon that they use, this abstract metaphysical stuff, it's all just it's all just hooey. And so he he refounds political philosophy and the, the goal of a regime on what seems to be a very materialistic ground. Yeah several things are uh important to point out. Uh, you could read them as a libertarian, but you could read him as defending, you know, totalitarianism. I don't think that's a fair reading of him. I think that's what a lot, you know, a lot of people, in fact, usually it's people accusing other people of being Hobbesians, right? <laughs> right He's right. usually used in a negative way. I think the authoritarian view of him comes from the idea of, well, when it comes to what kind of government you should have after you've formed it, he seems to favor monarchy. Yep. He actually, I think it's pretty clear, he actually thinks the first governments will be democracies because 
His point is we all form a social contract. That's all of us contracting with each other to have a government. So he says in the beginning, you're going to be a democracy. Then he thinks over time, you're going to delegate all that power to a monarch. I've actually had the good fortune to actually hold in my hands a first edition of Hobbes. We do have one at the Berkeley Library, and so I was actually able to look at it. This is the actual cover right. of the first copy, the first edition. It was an, an engraving that mm-hmm. Hobbes, he didn't do the engraving, but he, he was working with the publisher who did. Yes, I think, shockingly, he hired a French person to do mm. it, but uh, no one's That's where perfect. where it all started no one's to perfect. go wrong. Yeah. But if you look at the picture, it is, um, the, you know, there's a king, the sovereign, but it's made up of all the little, the, the actual people of the Commonwealth. And so this was a thing that was important to him was, you know, he, I don't really think he rejects divine right. It's yeah. not, the king is not given the power to govern from God. The king is our representative. And the point he's trying to say is like, you know, the government is us. It's our representative. And this sovereign does not have to bow to anybody. He, he, he makes the point that if you are, in the society, and you are a member now of the social contract, you you don't really have a right to complain when the sovereign punishes you because you, the sovereign is your representative. So you have no one to blame but yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and furthermore, even ecclesiastical power, or maybe especially ecclesiastical power, has absolutely nothing to say to the sovereign. The sovereign is head not only of the civil government, but for an, all intents and purposes, he's head of the church too. Yes, yeah, so th- and that's why he gets accused of being this kind of absolutist. This he doesn't think there can be limits on the power of the sovereign. Although interesting, he thinks anyone can be sovereign too, right? right? So he's he's kind of an egalitarian or libertarian in that mm-hmm. sense. He doesn't think nature or God appoints any particular person. But once you choose a sovereign, is a it's a continuing question of political theory and of constitutional law. Can you really limit the power of the government? When you are the ones creating the government, you have eventually, essentially given it all of your own powers right. um, from the state and nature. So that's why I think it's fair to say he is accused of being an uh, absolutist. On the other hand, in the work itself, he doesn't have a lot to say about the government telling you how to live your life. I have a hard time thinking he would think uh, the government should tell us not to use gas stoves anymore. <laughs> it doesn't have to do with maintaining basic law and order. Hobbes is Leviathan really doesn't get involved. And so that's why I could see libertarians actually finding some things in Leviathan that are attractive. Right. So he's focused on these very basic things, peace, order, security. And he says, I'm not going to pay attention to all those metaphysical musings, which is why something else he was accused of being, even in the 17th century, was perhaps an atheist. (laughs) He attacks ecclesiastical power. He mocks metaphysical musings. He grounds political philosophy in basically a materialist way. What do you think? Well, and also, uh, if you look at the Leviathan, most people, when they quote from the Leviathan, are quoting from the middle third of the book. And the last third of the book, when you look at it, it wrestles a lot with the question of the church yeah. and established religion. And uh, you know, controversially, I think he thought that the king should be, right, mm-hmm. that the sovereign should be the head of the church. The sovereign should appoint, as, as was the case in England, right, right, at this time with the Anglican church. And that goes to your point because he's not talking about there being a secondary alternative source of authority that could interfere with the commands of the sovereign. In fact, he goes so far as wanting to have the church in some way under the command of the state so that you wouldn't have this problem. No, I, I suspect right now is a very good time to be reading Hobbes because if he's not the father of liberalism, he's at least the grandfather of liberalism. We think maybe John Locke is the father of liberalism, but Hobbes is there writing earlier, bringing forth these ideas that reject what came in the past. People are increasingly talking about post-liberalism, yeah. this idea that for the past few hundred years, we've all just been liberals in the classical sense or in the progressive sense or in this sense or that sense. We're conservative, we're right liberals or we're left liberals. But there are some people suggesting that liberalism was just a mistake from the start. It's based on false premises, a false anthropology, and we just got to throw the whole thing out. So the, the question that I wonder as I'm reading Hobbes is, mm. well, is he right? Even though you didn't read Leviathan, sounds like you've been reading a lot of other philosophers, <laughs> uh, some dangerous ideas you're toying with. But no, I, in the conservative movement, there has been this rise of a return to the common good yep. uh, and a renewed interest in classic Catholic philosophy. 
And yeah, there are books and articles out there questioning whether liberalism has failed or whether we should replace originalism on, on the Supreme Court with a jurisprudence that really looks about pursuing the sumum bonum, yep. you know, taking certain values and using them uh, when we interpret the Constitution and our laws. And uh, actually, there's one of the arguments being made in that regard is coming from the Harvard uh, law professor, Adrian Vermeule. Good friend of mine. And, yeah. and so Adrian con- continues to draw this distinction between two senses of, of law or right, mm-hmm. which, use and lex. Mm-hmm. And this is lex being the laws you read it in statutes the and constitutions, law. the yeah. written law, and use being the kind of background principles on, on which the lex rests. And I was struck because Hobbes takes up that very mm-hmm. question and makes a, a, an important point of that distinction in Leviathan. Ah, well, in Leviathan, you could say Hobbes is also the father of uh, modern law, the way we think of law as being what we call positivism. The law is only what's written, and uh, the law is the commands of a sovereign. And the idea that's really uh, from the Middle Ages and before is uh, there's all this unwritten law, which is in some ways sometimes superior to the written law. I think the American system, we talk about people like Justice Scalia or Judge Bork, a lot of the great conservative thinkers about law, they rejected that idea, hmm. right? They, uh, they would be Hobbesian in the sense right. that we should only interpret and focus on the written words and try to understand what the writers of the Constitution understood those words to mean, but we're not allowed to incorporate values, morals outside that written law. I remembered the late Justice Scalia, when he was asked if he believed in a living constitution, he said, no, I think the constitution is dead. I think it's <laughs> ink on paper yes. and it's dead. And, and so yeah. he was describing this positive, positivist yeah. view of yeah. the law. Yeah. And so I think this is interesting. Hobbes then would be criticized by both liberals and conservatives on this <laughs> point because right, liberals have said, oh, where's the right to abortion? If it's not in the text, we should still bring it in from beyond the law. And now conservatives, I think, maybe because they're encouraged by this, you know, large Trump-appointed Supreme Court majority we have now, they would say, why don't we do the same thing but for conservative values? And Hobbes, I think, would reject hmm. both of those point of, points of view. He would say, no, we, that would be in a way like allowing those medieval or ancient philosophers back in, right. you know, and his, you know, his contribution is to say, no, the law is really what the sovereign commands and it has legitimacy because we right, left the state of nature, wrote a social contract to give that power to the sovereign, but nothing more than that. Right. And an, another part of the pitch of Leviathan and the later liberal project that followed is, OK, we're not going to be talking about the things that you want to talk about and you might not get everything that you want out of the government, but it will be much more stable. And And Hobbes takes up this concept of what's called anacyclosis, mm-hmm. uh, put forward by Polybius, and Aristotle talks about this, that there is this cycle of regimes that we see, monarchy into democracy, into aristocracy. And what's curious about the way Hobbes talks about it is, in the ancient understanding of this, you had a good version and a bad version. There's monarchy, which is good, tyranny, bad. Mm-hmm. Aristocracy, good, oligarchy, bad. Democracy, good. Mob rule, very bad. And Hobbes seems to say, oh, piffle. Mm -hmm. There's these three forms of government. That's true. But you only use the different terms depending on whether or not you like the guy. It doesn't actually reflect anything real in politics. I think Hobbes is, first of all, you're right. Hobbes does say that. It's really whether you like what that government actually did. (laughs) Right. I think what he says has a lot of truth. You know, one person's aristocracy is another person's oligopoly. Uh, What's the real difference aside from you just happen to like or dislike the outcomes. Now, the, the that's ancient true. or medieval understanding would be, well, the, the good versions, you know, the monarchy and the aristocracy and the democracy, they're the ones that govern for the common good, not in their own self-interest. And the tyrannies and the, the oligarchies and the mob rule, that's when people in any of those versions of government uh, just turn their attention toward their own base self-interest. So then is Hobbes' answer to that? Well, that's what everybody's doing anyway. Yeah, it's interesting because Hobbes is not calling on the government. It's, 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 it's an interesting problem. People have written and tried to think about this quite a bit is how does Hobbes persuade us that once we give this vast power to the sovereign, that the sovereign will do the right thing? You know, what's to prevent abuse of power? And maybe you mentioned Locke. Maybe that's where Locke takes mm-hmm. the ball and run, runs with it a little more because right, Locke also says there's a state of nature. 
Locke also says there's a social contract. But then Locke, Locke starts to talk more about, well, how do we make sure the government's powers don't go too far? Locke introduces a separation of powers as different parts of the government checking each other, which would make no sense to Hobbes, right? right? But because Hobbes doesn't worry so much about uh, the abuse of power by the sovereign. There's no external check in a way, right? Because he doesn't allow the possibility of religion or natural law after the formation of government itself stopping the government from what it does. Really, the, the main check, I, I think he thinks of it is if you think that the sovereign is no longer protecting your life, if the sovereign is no longer maintaining law and order, then you have the right to withdraw your consent right. to the government and say, I'm going to reform with some, uh, some other people, form some other uh, sovereign. And Hobbes is blunt enough on on removing one's consent from this political order and forming a new sovereign, which is, well, if the sovereign can't keep order, then mm -hmm. he's no longer the sovereign, I guess. Yeah, so it's, it's actually interesting, as you say, uh, as you said earlier, you know, conservatives and liberals could critique Hobbes. You know, Hobbes is writing in the time of the English Civil War when a king was beheaded <laughs> and parliament governed and they gave all the power to the Lord Protector, Lord Cromwell. You know, so some people thought, Hobbes was justifying their right of revolution. Other people thought, oh no, he's still defending a monarchy here. Uh, so as you say, people on both sides, even back in the 17th century, were you know, accusing others of being Hobbesian or using Hobbes for their own right. purposes. But I think actually he's charting a course that's more subtle than either of these sides give him credit for. The concepts that he's introducing, especially the state of nature or the social contract or even human equality, are these real anthropological observations he's making, or are they just nice ideas that we ought to live by, whether it really happened or not? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> even Hobbes says, uh, you know, I know the state of nature may never have actually existed, right? right? But, you know, it's an artificial construct yeah. to allow us to think through uh, the basic questions of why do we have government and why do we obey it? But the other things I think he's right to reject was, you know, they're, as you say, you've read them very carefully. It's, you know, the, the ancients seemed to think there were some people born to govern and some people born to be governed. <laughs> now, Jefferson in the Declaration says it's life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, where Hobbes says, actually, it's the equality to kill each other. <laughs> that makes us all equal. <laughs> but he's the one who first starts out with the idea that we all right. have this equality, <laughs> is that he really bases it on a certain kind of reciprocity and consent. And that's another thing that's really new with him is that society and government comes from our consent to it. And we make a contract with each other to live in this society together. It's not because God ordered it. It's not because some were born to, you know, Jefferson said, ride with boots and spurs on the backs of other people, <laughs> right? Jefferson said, that's what we're rejecting in America. And I think that's also true, particularly in America, right? Where we had a revolution, where yeah. we decided to throw off government by another country and establish ourselves. And so a lot of the things that Hobbes is thinking about the state of nature, social contract, I think they are actually even more important for America mm -hmm. because we had a revolution. We did cut off ties. So we had to think ourselves about why do we have this country? Why, does it, why do we give some powers to the government and keep some for ourselves? That maybe Europeans who've been living there for 3,000 years, they never really thought about. Right, right. If people are disenchanted with America, well, they're going to be disenchanted with Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> and if people are red, white, and bleed the red, white, and blue and shoot off fireworks and eat hot dogs because every day is the 4th of July, well, they're going to have to thank Thomas Hobbes, without whom the American Revolution would be completely unimaginable. Does Hobbes's political project provide the kind of stability and off-ramp from some of the, the errors of the past that he seems to think it does. I do, and I think some of the reason has, is because of some things I think he shared or maybe influenced with our founders, but which for which people often criticize him, which is, you, you read the famous passage, you know, in the state of nature, life is, you know, nasty, poor, brutish, short, solitary, right? It's great. There's a few more adjectives. We have more modern <laughs> words, but that's pretty good for the 17th century. And, 
You know why? Because he thinks people are not fundamentally good. Yeah. He said people are driven by a desire to have power over things, right? To, to make their life better, even at the expense of other people. You see this reflected in the Federalist Papers. You mm. see this reflected in the founding. James Madison in the Federalist Papers says famously, if men were angels, we wouldn't need a government. It's because people are pursuing their self-interest and may not necessarily be good that we mm. need government at all. Well, and this is where we get even the title of the book, Leviathan. Leviathan refers to this monster in the Bible, and the monster is traditionally understood to symbolize envy, the demon of envy. Mm. So, so how do we, and you, you see this reflected in the Ten Commandments too, so much of the Ten Commandments deals with s- discouraging you from coveting things mm-hmm. b- because this can lead to a war of all against all. But this idea that of all the sins, mm. envy poses a particular threat to a political order. Mm. Uh, so much so, it would seem to me, at least in my interpretation, that that's why Hobbes puts the monster right on the cover of the book. Well, I think also, you know, you could say how bad people are yeah. determines how strong the Leviathan has to be, hmm. right? So hmm. you look at when Hobbes is alive, the 17th century, he's been through this terrible civil war. Again, that witnessed the execution of a king, almost a dictatorial protectorate, and then the restoration of a king, and then another a glorious <laughs> revolution. You know, he Actually, Hobbes lived quite a long time. But if you thought people had more glimmerings of good to them, right? You may not need a gigantic <laughs> Leviathan to restrain them right. as strongly as Hobbes thinks necessary. And so maybe that's where uh, the uh, the founding is a little different hmm. in that our founding, yes, it starts out with this idea. And that's, I think, our founding unusually is conservative. If you yep. want to get into modern philosophy, right, right. the American Revolution is conservative in this sense, whereas the other great revolutions, French, Russian, Chinese, they're not. The French, Russian, Chinese revolutions are built on the idea that man is fundamentally good and society oppresses him or her. And so we need to get rid of that society and remake it into this like utopia. The American revolution is conservative in the sense that it doesn't see society as naturally suppressing. Right? In fact, the reason we had a revolution was because the British government wasn't living up to the constitutional ideals that right. we agreed with. The idea that the American colonists were asserting their rights as British subjects. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah we're being, as usual, more British than the British. That's why we <laughs> love to watch Downton Abbey, probably higher <laughs> numbers than they do. right? But the, but the American Revolution, in a sense, is conservative. It wants to go back yeah. where it's not forwards. It rejects this idea that government's going to produce this utopia. Instead, mm. it's the idea that government will be limited and that people on our own should be left to make our own decisions, lead our own lives. And I think that also comes from Hobbes. People are to be left on their own. They can decide whether or not they want to read Leviathan for now. But if the sovereign who has the power to ban books, if the sovereign decides Mm. that everyone is going to read Leviathan, you know that they're going to do it. (laughs) John, thank you so much for coming on the show. If you have not read the book yet, read it now because... As I recently learned, I came out of my ignorance, I recently learned that whatever you think of the modern political world, good or bad, if you want to understand where it started, you got to read this book. We'll see you next time on The Book Club. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Book Club on PragerU. PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations from viewers like you to keep this content on the air. Please consider making a tax-deductible contribution today to help keep this content coming. Thank you very much.